Today is the third uh, date following the site visit on Monday and the first lecture, series of lectures yesterday talks. And we learned yesterday that there is um, why we should be looking at industrial space. So there's a rising demand, there's falling supply, and that constitutes a problem. And that means that there's not only an opportunity to engage with uh, intensification of industrial space and maybe thinking about industrial space and making space in different ways, but there's a need as well. And so today we're going to um, hear about some uh, proposals um, or a propositional uh, analysis and proposals. And I'm um, going to jump right in. Uh, we are, where is our timekeeping? Yeah, under the table. Yeah. So she's going to pop up at uh, 10 minute intervals yeah. and say next. We'll agree on next. And yeah, there she is. And uh, the first one is uh, Mikel Axona and from Hawkins Brown. Uh, he's an uh, architect and urban designer. I had the pleasure of, of uh, studying some years back with my esteemed colleague Liza. Yeah. And who is. Um, and he's been doing um, research on industrial land for the last five years, uh, both here and in the Basque country. Yep. Good. And now uh, uh, your presentation is should be on here. And there it is, Straight over away. here. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, apologies, I have a terrible flu. And hopefully I won't stop coughing as I speak. Um, Hawkins Brown, we're in the in St. John Street, and apart from many other stuff, we also love industry and we've been doing research on industrial land in the past year uh, or so, mainly focused on Victoria Road, which I'll be showing uh, in a moment. Industry is changing the city, and the city is also changing industry. And, and the proof is that we're all here and we're all talking about industry, which we didn't happen five years ago, for example. And it's an ma uh, important matter that is now coming out, as we, as we could all see yesterday uh, at the lectures, at a more uh, strategic, strategic level, possibly, where we were seeing uh, the market trends, the big... Uh, logistic uh, industries uh, and the uh, huge scale um, uh, units proposed by Sigro. And, and well, even if it's just for summarizing it, <coughs> uh, we, know, we know well that industry is not what it was in the 19th century, it's not the dirty, uh, contaminating, um, ugly kind of uh, activity, but there's been a, a big change since those um, times. And actually, at the moment, we're living a, a really big uh, retail revolution, which is, again, as we saw yesterday, turning into into logistics more than production. But at the same time, we're seeing other uh, revolutions, we are, which are moving production into smaller and um, less dependent on mass production uh, types, which are probably the ones that were not uh, tackled yesterday. At the same time, uh, market pressures, industrial activities pushed out, and many other activities that normally would serve city centers, like churches or like uh, call centers, gyms that are moving into, into industrial areas because of these pressures. And that is, that is uh, the reason why we're all talking at the moment about the need of intensifying and making better use of land. So yes, we, we think uh, mix is the answer to many of these uh, issues. And not just mix, uh, in the way that we see it happening in London and in, in, in many other cities where residential units coexist with other retail or office uses. We think it's super mix uh, what's coming forward or what is needed and what's need, what needs to be explored. Um, and therefore we, need, we think there's, there's a need to, to understand 
the scales of these production networks, the locations of these production networks, networks and also the, the markets that they serve. And as a conclusion to that, we could say also that uh, many of, the, of these businesses that we're seeing pushed out belong in the high streets or the city centers. Uh, if we want to achieve intensification, as we saw yesterday, um, Michael and Alex were Michael and Alex were telling us how in other countries we always find um, interesting examples that are working, some built examples or planning examples, and the question is why and how do they do it? How come we can't make it? Uh, so we've been working on, on Victoria Road, and as part of our research and, and the set of tools that we've created for the OPDC, we obviously, as everyone else, and probably most of you have uh, looked at other examples around the world, but try to organize them uh, in these three, try to look at, at these three categories within each of the case studies to really understand what's, what's happening and how they work. Um, so we, uh, these three key drivers uh, were analyzed in, in 15 different case studies from the reserved lands, SEMU areas of Brussels to the laissez-faire uh, kind of zone in, in, in Japan or, or the Navy yards in, in Brooklyn or even some examples here in London uh, with the new Covent Garden uh, market. Uh, yes, there's, there's lots of activity, different activity happening in this industrial area. This is Park Royal um, with lots of uh, yeah, logistics, bakers, uh, cabinet makers, film studios, prop makers and, stuff, and other stuff. But at the same time, as I was saying before, we've seen how industrial land is becoming a collector of all the other uses that cities are not accepting. And what this is showing us, uh, if we look at it in a positive way, is how uh, capable industrial land is of accepting everyone and all types of uses, and how flexible these uh, uh, buildings are to kind of accept uh, different types of growth, internal uh, subdivisions, great access, and so on, which I guess if you are all working on these competitions are, are, are things you need to be looking at. Um, and that's why these, these situations, these flexibilities uh, and this closeness of activities, in, in many cases uh, we've seen industries that actually rent out their spaces, their awkward spaces that are not usable for their production. Uh, they rent them out to other uses. So it is this, this closeness that I, I prefer calling, I, I mentioned Sopimix before, but I think it's uh, better described by the word hyper-adjacency, which is describing more the closeness and, and the networks that can be created by this closeness. So as I was telling, we've, we've been working on the OPDC in the last year. We've been looking at the Park Royal site on the left, which is said to be the biggest industrial area in Europe and it's often called the Kitchen of London. We've done an intensification work uh, together with We Made That, who were speaking yesterday as well. But I won't talk about that. I will speak a little bit about uh, the Victoria Road and all, um, all the plain, which is this central bit, this central corridor that sits in between the two walls, a very huge uh, and clearly characterized in the industrial area. And Old Oak, which is to be one of the biggest developments in the UK, with 20,000 new homes, more than 50,000 uh, new jobs uh, or employment spaces to be created. And the aim of our development framework was to kind of see the, how we could make these two uh, ecologies uh, coexist and intermix. Uh, so it, it's it's. It's been a, a huge document, it's like, well, tackling many other issues. 
looking at public realm and, 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 and other other things, but one of the bits that we worked on was the employment strategy. Uh, the HS2 is coming, a huge station, and they're going to basically clean out the whole industrial areas in order to be able to place their construction sites. So uh, once the construction is gone, it's all clean, there's nothing, just the existing residential areas. and. Uh, a few existing uh, seal designated protected industrial areas. So, as part of our work, um, we thought it was we needed something else to kind of articulate this very differentiated types of uh, protected land from the um, seal industrial, purely industrial to the residential, and uh, we created this um, tool that kind of started being a tool for us to, to help us kind of locate um, um, areas on the site, but then became um, a tool to um, kind of set the types of mixes that we would allocate in each of the sites. And in a way, this would help us uh, control in a better way the, the flow of, of the city, the character of each of the, are of each of the areas. and. Um, and yes, yeah, in the end, uh, it's, it's actually something that we are already testing in some other sites in London because we think it could be something um, useful. But basically, it's a tool that works in two ways. One is plan making, so defining the, the types of mix and the amount of mix that could happen in each of the sites. If you look, uh, the central bits have more of a... Um, interlocked and mixed uh, character while the edges are lower and we relate all these uh, parameters with other things like PTAL and accessibility for vans and uh, specific use classes and obviously uh, such an abstract um, and uh, simple tool can, can solve everything and, and, and I think actually it could be an error to think it's good so uh, we also created another set of um, tools that would help um, this to be applied in a more um, gentle way. Because um, we think urban design uh, can, can achieve more. Yesterday there was a very interesting question at the end of the lecture asking whether intensification and mix could be achieved just by design or was it by planning? And I think, it, well, the response of mo almost everyone was that it's actually both of them, but I would add that it's not just even those. You would also need to add many other layers like going into, I don't know, you could add politics or even education, but design is de definitely uh, a key uh, marker. And so, Next one. We, <laughs> so we give them, do you think we should give them like two more minutes, maybe? <laughs> let's think about it, let's think about it. No, two more minutes, maybe. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we created another set of tools as well as assisting this placement in principles uh, through an urban guidance that, again, brought some other case studies but looked at site-specific uh, conditions that these uh, developments and mixed conditions need to look at in order to, to be more, um, in order to be better applied and better um, adapted to their sites. And yeah, one minute. Uh, we think residential mix can work and it does work and at various different scales. Everyone always shows this image of Tandem, but there are many other examples in Europe, in central, central cities, this is Sevilla, <coughs> right in the middle of the city, old city next to the church. And these things are happening there. So again, we think it's scale, we think it's location, and we think it's understanding the markets that are being served by this industries that need to be coordinated. Uh, 
this is one of the initial case studies that we were showing. Um, I, we think this one is quite uh, representative because uh, it kind of defends or protects the industry or the activity that was before, and therefore, in this case, it, uh, it creates kind of a noise rule that has to be achieved not by the industries but actually by the homes. So it's forcing homes to have a specific uh, protection in the windows and facades uh, so that they won't hear the, the, the noise that is there. So it's actually looking at it from a different way. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's allowing these uh, mixes to happen uh, when the strat strategic importance of those uh, big industries in the port are crucial. And I'm finishing with this image, which is just a playful kind of drawing that we've done recently, which is summarizing some of the learning from the past years uh, and collecting some of the very technical things, very technical issues, but also some of the more planning and logistic kind of uh, needs that the uh, um, businesses have from the conversations that we have from them, uh, with them, sorry. And yeah, I would end up saying encouraging all of you, not just focusing on, on, a, on a design exercise, but actually looking at ways of managing and ways of uh, making these uh, schemes viable and, and, and to make the whole thing feasible and, and, and realistic. Because I think there's, there's a lot to be uh, thought of there's a lot out there, but, but we need even more to, to kind of start uh, having interesting discussions about the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, um, Oscar is next. So you are, um, to remind you of the order. <laughs> Which I slightly right. But I forgot to mention is uh, that so so why do architects is it important for architects to engage with industrial land? Yes, it is, and um, but maybe we haven't been doing it for a very long time, and universities haven't been doing it for a very long time, but they're doing now, and it's um, we're going to see some examples from three different universities today of, of student work, and kind of that's something I think about today as well that I forgot to mention is a mixture of people in practice and uh, people who've um, studying or have just graduated. And next up, so you mentioned uh, OPTC and, and that's something that, that we've been looking at at University um, uh, Book Launch. Don't forget to come back. And, um, and Orska, who um, is going to show her project, which is placed um, in the OPTC area. And she's got a background in graphics and uh, landscape design, and uh, studied on the MA uh, urbanism, <laughs> and has worked for the city of Ljubljana before. Yeah, but I'm just a student. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't worked. I only worked through like student status, and I'm still holding to my student status because it's. Uh, I, I I'm afraid to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, um, so as we saw earlier, I, I just came to London like um, this year, I mean to, to do an MA program at the University of East London. So I didn't know the city earlier, I just was thrown into this like... I come from a country with two million people, it's like the, the capital city has 200,000 people, it's, it's nothing in comparison to this. So this was frustrating. Um, anyway, um, so we kind of, the project was about one small location within OPDC development that, that Mikhail was um, talking about earlier. And it's on the edge between um, like a park, which is protected in some, and then from the south there is residential and of course the um, industrial land. And um, it's kind of been dissected with, with all the railways and, and what is happening there actually is, to be uh, um, like the whole redevelopment of only residential, uh, with only residential use. Um, we started the, uh, to tackle the issue with some case studies, 
and these are all residential um, uh, buildings within London. Um, and we were kind of trying to put them on, on the site and see how they would react to each other. <coughs> but what I found out that those buildings were built for that place where they were built and in the time where they were, when they were built and they weren't meant really to coexist and I couldn't feed them on the land just like with, with no bearings, like I needed something to hold on. Um, because in landscape architecture you normally look at topos, you normally look at, um, at spatial and um, time, like you look at the timeline, what, how, how actually the urbanistic development went through. <coughs> And it's hard to work on tabula rasa, like, okay, you can make a major redevelopment, but it's not meaningful, I would say. So I, I wanted to do something meaningful. Um, so I went there to the, to the site and kind of looked at it in more detail. So I didn't make research. I know that there is a high demand on the residential, and I know that London is uh, losing industrial land, but I kind of read it in between the lines, not, not that I kind of made a big research on it. Um, but what I found out that um, the street on the south, Brunel Street, is, you know, it's the Brunel Street, so it's uh, um, speaking of industrial site in, in its name anyway. Um, and it was most interesting because it's uh, on the border with residential and on uh, with industrial land as well. And it's quite active, the, the ground floor activity is very vivid. The, the things that are already there were, in my opinion, worth keeping. And I was just looking at how they could coexist with, um, with other uses as well. So you have Aston Martin, you have Vaga Mama, you have uh, like Bakery, you have uh, Farley's, which are also in movies industry. Um, and it's a lot of ground floor activity that could be um, brought out on the street and could intermix and play with, with residential and other working um, units, for example. Uh, so I was looking at OPDC development plan, which is 100% housing on, on this land. Um, so boring, basically. Um, and at the moment, there is 0% housing. And I was looking then how, with the mixed use, we could he keep some of the existing uses or add some new uses and how they could transform during the time. But if uh, we would compensate and build in, in the height, like with fireproof stuff, then we could maybe gain the same percentage of, of housing while keeping some industrial uses or implementing new ones. But one slide I didn't incorporate in this presentation, which is kind of important to me, is a piecemeal growth of like piecemeal development. So it's not like from zero to all in one month, but like slowly adding pieces, pieces like a puzzles to the whole story. Um, so I went inside three buildings, okay, I went inside one building, but this, there are three uh, <laughs> uh, warehouses on Brunel Street that are um, most interesting because of their old architecture. Um, they're kind of uh, Art Deco style warehouses, and they're also vacant at, at this time. Um, and it's an amazing space, an empty amazing space. And I was looking how the ground floor is of this warehouse is uh, kind of messy, and it I I would want to keep this as a as a reference point from where this what this land was used earlier for and what can be added to it. So here is where I got the idea of what happens with the with this warehouse. Mm -hmm. You rip off the roof, you keep some structural elements that are kind of really cool looking just because they're really cool looking like um, steel structure and stuff and you just erect a tower on top of it. So I, I like the warehouse shell. I like because it implies the productivity of, of the land. Um, and I kind of, this is space arrangement that I had for this project. So in front um, there is a local store, a community space or whatever there could be, but like the, you know, the front facade. Um, there inside the shell, there's a workshop space with different units. 
Uh, first floor of the tower would be uh, an office space, um, and on top of the roof people could, could walk, of course, and then there is a residential tower on top. So all, all this is under one roof. Um, this is space arrangement on street level. Um, I took, like, just to communicate better, I took um, three buildings. I mean, the, the middle one is, is my interest, and then the two others, how they could kind of relate. On top of this one, I put uh, UL student housing, like how this uses food mix. And then on the left one, I put Walters Way, for example, or small scale residential units. Um, how urbanistically this would work, how, um, how people working with lorries could kind of access um, the space if workshops are in behind and uh, how pedestrians w would move um, through the space with, you know. Um, but yes, I think it would work just, just without a problem. Uh, this is vertical and horizontal relationship. So, um, street, then you have shop, community space, you have, you know, goods coming to the, to the, to the building, to, to the workshop units. You have roof, which is kind of an outdoor courtyard, living room, whatever. Then you have office space, and then you have residential um, units on top uh, with community. Um, but it's all about flexibility. As, as this, then the floor plan is also kind of. I don't think we can um, just put into law everything. I mean, some things just need to happen sporadically, I'd say, I don't know. So I, I designed this uh, floor plan for, for people to to adjust their living spaces as, as they would wish, um, from studio to one bedroom, um, commercial space, um, two bedroom and three bedroom apartments, and they can kind of, they're like puzzles, they can be rearranged um, as, as pleased. These are atmospheres that I try to create under one roof. So it's basically <coughs> the warehouse would work as an indoor street, and you just need to kind of figure out the way how pedestrians and how lorries would would mix and all the working units. And then another living space, uh, an office, and a home. So it's intimacy. It's a private, public, but kind of a community sense within one house. And main idea is also changeability, so adding new stuff and just changing. I mean, space is changing all the time, so I don't know if uh, if everything being planned works. I mean, we need to allow for a change in life. That's it. Next is Christian. So uh, Christian is a um, business owner of A Models. They do um, fantastic models for architects, and he is also an initiator of the Canyon Street Land Trust co-initiator, and they're promoting an exciting alternative to what seemed been um, maybe inevitable expansion of King's Cross, which I hope he's going to tell us about. Okay. Uh, now, let's just go next. Hey, good. Is that actually? Do you want to check? No. You send me six images. I hope I put them in the right order. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Okay. So. Um, so, why am I here? Who am I? I? I have a business making architectural models uh, in an uh, industrial estate uh, ju just behind King's Cross Station, where uh, we've been for nine years. Uh, uh, until recently, I employed roughly 20, 22 people. Um, and the business is over 20 years old. Um, for various reasons, which I will explain shortly, uh, we're under threat as a place to uh, have a factory, and uh, I'm actively in, engaged in trying to stay there, basically. And we've had, with lots of people's help, we've, we've come up with a potential solution. Um, let's see this. That's my office, um, that's our industrial estate. So it's 
just what kind of what I think you'd expect to see if I <coughs> describe an industrial estate. Um, this is where we are. Um, the uh, area outlined in red, I'm colour blind, I think it's red, um, <laughs> is the extent of our neighbourhood forum. Uh, on one side, this is uh, uh, Central St Martins and King's Cross stations about here. Or is it there? Um, no, it's there. Uh, and we've come together with the uh, adjacent residential community and the industrial community to create a neighbourhood forum to basically have some representation in what happens to our hood, essentially. Um, but I'd like to describe who my neighbours are. So the area in yellow is the industrial area where uh, I have my uh, two industrial units. Um, next to me we have a company called Alara, which is the largest organic muesli factory in the world, uh, with about 75 employees. Um, uh, Next to me, we have the training standards office where they keep all the confiscated, uh, I presume, fake goods that they raid from all sorts of places over Canada. There's piles of uh, dodgy Polish beer that isn't really dodgy Polish beer, it's fake dodgy Polish beer, and Louis Vuitton and Arsenal football t shirts and stuff like that. Um, we have um, about 125 fishmongers in one company, 75 butchers, uh, 30 odd people in laundry business, uh, we have the salt store for when it snows. And there's all these uh, uh, functions in these buildings that you, you wouldn't imagine by looking at the estate, because all the buildings are blank. Um, there are maybe 40 or so car menders. I used to call them car breakers. Car menders. Um, and uh, we're all under threat, basically, because our leases uh, have expired. Um, and the adjacent community, which is what looks like houses on there, it is houses. Uh, it's a residential community with about 500 homes. Um, they're not exactly under threat other than worrying about what is inevitably gonna come to the end of their street. Um, so the, the issue for us, um, basically from my uh, front door at work, I could count 21 cranes last summer on the horizon. So basically, it's what I call Manhattan is marching up the street, and it clearly is marching up the street. The cranes are getting closer and closer. Um, our uh, landlord is Camden, and they uh, finished the leases on all the businesses back in 2012. So basically, all the businesses have a very insecure status, uh, and that's, uh, that's, it's quite difficult to run a business if you don't know where you're going to be in a year's time or two years' time, especially a big business. Um, and student towers, ironically. Um, lots of buildings are getting planning permission to become towers for students because it's a very uh, financially rewarding way to uh, develop a property. Not because students need more homes, it's just a very good way of making money and you can avoid section 106 as I understand it. So the residential community are concerned about student towers. There's already one new student tower and the students basically don't engage with the community. Uh, this, this, almost a commodity, they're perfectly nice, but they're not, they don't bring anything to the community. So another 10 towers of students is like 10 more nothings, in, as the neighbours see it. So the uh, residential community are quite actively involved in trying to do something different. Um, so there's two other very specific threats. Uh, Camden has a project which they call the Community Investment Programme, which they're very proud of, which basically means flogging off their real estate assets to pay for all the things that they can't afford to pay for because of government cuts over recent years. And the housing crisis is the worst of all because that means you've got a good excuse to sweep anything out of the way to make houses because mm -hmm. everybody needs houses and it doesn't matter what you destroy on the way. Um, so we came together and made this neighbourhood <coughs> forum and we're developing a neighbourhood plan. But, uh, we realised a more urgent and pressing issue, very specifically with the industrial estate, effectively being up for sale or imminently being up for sale. Um, so we had to come up with something quite drastic, quite urgently. And as a group, essentially coming out of the neighbourhood forum, um, with the help of uh, lots of friends. So we have a big professional team who have come up with a proposition um, which is architects, there's one here, 
from Karakus Rich Carson. We have uh, a big legal team, a planning team, uh, cost consultants, uh, engineers, all, all sorts of people backing us up, uh, all pro bono for free, to try and create uh, uh, something that's never been done before, essentially. Um, uh, so what is our proposal? Okay. Um, let's see what we've got here. So the, um, uh, the orange area is the smallest, uh, the immediately under threat industrial part uh, where my office is. Um, we're proposing to, uh, using a community land trust where the community effectively takes ownership or at least a 100 year lease, uh, build on top of ourselves. So uh, with a decanted development, so we basically make a new building cause the least disruption to an existing business. We re-accommodate existing business uh, very close, i.e. ideally across the road from where they already are, um, and without their rent going up. But we add as much as 20 stories on top of um, meaningfully affordable housing. So we're increasing the density, which is what is effectively inevitable, um, with uh, high quality housing, hence uh, these architects. Um, and we're adamant that it should be uh, meaningfully affordable as opposed to what the government calls affordable. Um, part of the proposition is to, uh, because the community takes ownership, um, the whole financial model is over 75 years plus as opposed to a normal developer has to make their money and run within 25 years. Um, so because of that we can uh, plan a more expensive uh, higher quality build, which makes the maintenance costs much more efficient once you get beyond 30 years or so, and helps in the long term, but it also means you get a nicer place in the first place. Um, but we believe in what I call a, a, a gritty London sense, or a, a true live work, that we can uh, uh, juxtapose um, fishmongers and car menders and model makers with uh, a residential community without any issue at all. I mean, architecturally, if there's any issues with fumes or noise or anything, that's, that's, you can totally manage that with the physical structure of the buildings. But in a community sense, in a, uh, I'm going to say a shortage sense, it's actually a cool thing to um, be with these things that are already existing. But most importantly for me, it's, it's respecting the people who are already there. So uh, combined, we have about 600 employees on the site. Uh, we expect to be able to uh, more or less double that and add um, 750 homes, so homes for let's say up to 2,000 people. Uh, and we also have all the funding in principle uh, that could do it. It's just not our land, so it's speculative. Um, and that's more or less it. Um, there you go. I am giving a guided tour of the, this Saturday on a series of events called Empathy Walks, which you can find on Eventbrite. I don't know how you find that, but uh, the, the theme is Empathy Walks, and my walk is called There Is Nothing <coughs> There. And Saturday, Saturday, 12 o'clock. Sounds really good. Um, um, Elisa, Laura, oh, Sophia, yeah, and Jordan images, are next. It's not me next, I don't think. Oh. Would have made sense. It's true. Um, Sorry. I think through this a couple more. I'm going to talk about those in a minute anyway, don't worry. <laughs> okay. I like the way you don't even talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you've all studied um, at UCL. Yeah. yeah. You've done a project together, but you all have really different backgrounds, which is... Uh, Maybe interesting, maybe problematic. <laughs> but um, but the, <coughs> we just were co um, collaborating. But uh, Elisa is from Chile and um, she has the diploma in residential habitat and social nobility, which sounds really interesting mm -hmm. and relevant. Uh, so she's an urban designer. <laughs> <laughs> Safir is an architect uh, and uh, has studied architecture and urban planning from. Uh, Newcastle, Laura is the University of Michigan. Um, she's worked in residential and light commercial design for three years in Seattle. 
Yael Den is a landscape architect uh, from Israel. So um, you're going to tell us about the project in Bakke. Now the focus. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction, Mark. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we have an industrial audit uh, which is followed by an economic growth proposal for a site embarking in London. Uh, so, great. This is how we carried out the project uh, and what we'll be showing you today. So, we started with uh, a data, connect co data collection and analysis of uh, an industrial area. Uh, and then we used this to inform our design proposal for the site. Uh, as well as borough-wide policy proposals. Uh, and then following this, uh, we used the information that we got during our proposals uh, to develop uh, London-wide proposals uh, in policy to protect, to protect industrial land in London. So our site is the one that's here. Uh, it's, uh, it's in East London, and it's divided by the River Roading and by the North Circular Road and the A13. Uh, and it's situated in the boroughs of Newham and in the borough of Barking and Dagenham, uh, which means it has a range of policy drivers on, the, on site. Uh, here are a few of them. So, yeah, the, the, the borough boundaries are the yellow and the light orange, uh, and our site is one in orange. Uh, and the hatched lines there are the two opportunity areas on site. There's also, there are, there's also a lot of sill land nearby that's already been earmarked for redevelopment. Uh, so land is strategic industrial land. Uh, hopefully you know that already. <laughs> so looking at the content of these policy drivers, uh, we found that the London Industrial Land and Economy Study there uh, already says that uh, industrial land is being released at a higher rate than recommended, which has, uh, which has uh, long-term economic risk and uh, unintended consequences. So now we'll move on to our analysis of the site. Uh, for our study area, we started by collecting data through interviews, surveys, uh, site context and planning policy, uh, and also uh, planning applications and uh, the, the effect that they have on, uh, on the area. Uh, and then we developed a database which we used to inform our analysis uh, to reach our conclusions. Uh, our on-site interview sample consisted of 16% uh, of the 87 verified businesses on site. And uh, now Elisa will move on to our analysis and our findings. Um, confirmed businesses have been organized into a uniform set of categories determined by class. The most important businesses in the area were retail repair maintenance of motor vehicles that represented roughly 19% of the sample and construction and manufacture materials that represented around 17%. Uh, regarding the building types, uh, the most common typology in the study area were industrial shed and industrial building, which correlates obviously strongly with the bus business types categories. Uh, as mentioned before, the study area lies within two different um, opportunity areas and therefore is pretty prone to change uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, when visiting the area, we could realize that there were lots of construction of uh, residential-led development next to the river roading, especially. Uh, in the map, the bluish and the green areas uh, si are sites that have changed in the past uh, five years, are changing now or will in the future according to the planning applications. Um, in order to meet the London's uh, growing demand for housing, the Mayor of London has released a land use strategy which defines the areas uh, and determines which of those can be released uh, for the benefit of new housing. Uh, as Saf mentioned, this uh, industrial land release uh, pushes, obviously, uh, have some economic consequences and uh, pushes the industry from, the, from central London. In the maps, we can see in blue what was industrial land, and then in red over the years has changed to in red uh, residential. Uh, several conclusions can be drawn from the audit. One of them is that there are 67% of the businesses which specify that it's important for them to be located in, in the parking area. There are 92% of the businesses which supply Greater London and uh, the UK. 82% uh, of the interviewees stated that uh, all or most of the employees were uh, living in, this, in, the, in the area, so it was a very, an important asset for them to be there. The colorful pital map shows that uh, the area has poor, poor accessibility, 
Um, and some areas are to inaccessible at all by public transport. And uh, along with the below average rent in the area, it was found that uh, the, bus the businesses valued the parking area due to its good vehicular connectivity, the wealth of uh, development in the area, the proximity to international ports, and the access to local, local employees. And uh, the map up the right shows uh, in purple the construction industry cluster that we identified, in green the mm -hmm. automobile cluster, and in yellow uh, what, we, what we identified as the emerging creative industry. <coughs> So our proposal is divided into two sections, the site-specific design, um, which led to borough-wide policy recommendations, and then the site-wide strategy, which, um, or sorry, then the London-wide strategy, which drew out of those, um, that first part. Uh, industrial development is accommodated for, in two different ways in our proposal, through intensification and redevelopment. Intensification happens on sites that are not used to their full potential. Uh, buildings on site remain and they're intensified themselves. And then also there's infill buildings within that. And then redevelopment is where the site um, is completely underused and it's cleared and there would be new industrial or industrial residential mixed use development. So as you can see, the proposal has a blend of new and existing development. The blue spaces are <coughs> sites that um, will remain as existing, they're being used to their full potential or they're a school or something that doesn't relate. Um, the red sites are industrial, and the orange sites would be residential and industrial mixed. The goal of this is allowed to the is uh, the goal of this is to allow the existing buildings to remain, if at all possible, and for the clusters that we identify in Task One to be protected. So we decided to go um, into detail on two different little sites on um, in the study area. It's very strategic, but. Um, it kind of shows what we were, what we envisioned through these uh, redevelopment intensification strategies. So this is Fresh Wharf. Um, it lies on River Roading, and it's already identified by um, a developer. It already has a residential um, plan for the site, and um, but due to the fact that like 40 businesses are being displaced already, and it's, so it's already industrial. It's going to be residential. We kind of felt that. Um, in order to protect the businesses that were there, could be residential industrial mixed use. And so that's what we proposed for the site. Um, we have identified a few typologies that we think might be useful for the site. So this first one is um, a residential industrial mixed typology. It doesn't quite go into the amount of detail that you guys did, but we think that um, with the residential along the river and then the industrial behind with the green roof on top might be something that could work for the site. Um, as you can see, the residential is kind of along the river and the industrials push towards the busy highway. Um, and the second is stacked industrial. So the heavy industrial would be on the bottom and light industrial or lighter uses, whatever it might be, might be on top. And the second site is Kingsbridge, Kingsbridge Road Estate. And it's kind of severed by this highway at the north and then the river at the south. It's really hard to get to. Um, it's currently industrial, but not quite used fully. It's a lot of empty land and it's like, um, just a lot of trash that's on the land right now. So there's two buildings that are kind of okay. And we've kept, we've chosen to um, have those remain in the light gray and then infill sites um, or infill buildings along the side. And we've added two more typologies to this. One is another stacked but um, has second floor access. And then the other one is specifically for the auto industry. So it has garages along the outside. So the last part, the second part of our proposal was to come up with um, a London-wide strategy, with, sorry, <laughs> which includes some recommendations. Um, you can see on the map there's a compilation of strategic industrial sites, also of industrial land and opportunity areas. Oh, you can't see their site. It's there, big little circle. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what is unique about it is that it falls under all three categories. Our recommendations are relevant to other sites that fall under these categories. Um, in order to make these uh, recommendations, we built upon three documents. One was our survey, um, the London plan, and the just based document towards a community-led plan for London. We critically <coughs> analyze these, and the point of our recommendations is to either answer gaps in those documents um, or suggest new recommendations. We group them into these four themes. Um, 
which we will uh, explain very, very briefly. Um, in terms of policy making processes, um, it's important to, as we demonstrated, to conduct site specific audits, to identify um, existing sectorial clusters, and to protect businesses that are already there, as mentioned before. Um, in terms of the local economy, to enhance the existing networks and clusters that we identified, um, and to make rent affordable to new businesses, as Laura mentioned, parts of the typologies were meant to answer that. In terms of transport infrastructure, um, we recommend that intensification areas should be located near, um, with good accessibility, and re residential developments should be in close proximity to public transport systems and hopefully close to sound centers as far as possible. And last, but definitely not least, natural resources. Um, to build upon them as both financial and environmental assets, um, and to tie them to developments in, uh, through incentive mechanisms. That's all. Thanks. That was 10 minutes precisely. And uh, <laughs> when I had seen your presentation, I thought that you would Never be able to make that. Yeah, it's <laughs> well, amazing. Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> and um, I'm very glad that uh, Abigail is here. Abigail is a master planner and architect, and you've worked with uh, your practitioner, and you're an educator, mm -hmm. and and you're on maternity leave. Yeah, so, so, so especially yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, no, very appreciated that you've made time, and uh, you've worked for S333 before on projects in UK and um, Netherlands, and you're. Now at Kurkusovic Carlson Architect, yeah. and you're working, you're leading on the maritime water development, yeah. and you're working on the Kamenitz Street as well. Yeah, I know a bit about uh, right. this project as well, so we're going to talk about it. Over to you, Abigail. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so I think echoing a lot of the themes that have come through now, I'm trying to build a little bit more on the architectural language and very, two very specific sites we've been working on. I'm not going to talk about the big master planning, so this is the Madrian water project that I've been working on for the last couple of years for Enfield Council, which is delivering, in theory, 7,000 jobs and 10,000 homes, so it's a very large-scale project, working on a very long time scale, working with documents like area action plans, writing those with the local authority, and really understanding what a complicated process that is and what an unhelpful document that can be. So what I'm going to do today is try to skip over a lot of the policy stuff and try to zoom in to two very specific sites um, with very different clients but with similar themes, quite different um, densities. So one we're gonna, I'm going to show you is Cavalry Street which is the project that um, Christian has already introduced and that's a very a site which is under a lot of um, pressure in terms of development and <coughs> is a very high rise, vertically stacked, mixed project. And the other project I'm going to talk about in Enfield is in a, a very different context, low PTAR rating, quite um, isolated, currently very active, but that talks about how things can be stacked horizontally and arranged horizontally. So two very specific examples of design approaches. Um, so this is the site that we've already been talking about. <coughs> These sort of slightly um, complex boxes to read from the outside, but hugely flexible from the inside. And if you actually get to look inside some of these sort of big openings, you catch glimpses of really um, um, crucial parts of our city fabric and functions within there. Um, the industrial estate is immediately recognisable. It's an pedestrian, not inviting in terms of pedestrian access and flexibility. Having said that, it does have some very picturesque um, landscape elements within that, so trying to understand what the drivers are in terms of the industrial estate, but then also what the assets might be. So here, looking at the scale of the, the buildings required, the spans, so it becomes architecturally quite quickly, immediately clear that the industrial estate doesn't have the same structural span as an architectural project, <laughs> and trying to understand how that might influence it. Then looking at the types of sites that you get, which so in the case of um, Camley Street, very restricted access, um, hugely constrained by railways <clears throat> along one edge, and again, not very friendly for pedestrians. Then looking and understanding developmental pressures in the context. So um, you can see number one and three is two of the main, um, Camden's main uh, social housing estates which are undergoing redevelopment, densification. Um, 
So this is the sort of pressures that the local residents are starting to feel and recognise. Um, and then looking at um, the King's Cross estate, which I think has been a very successful type of um, development in terms of mix, but on something again that that was actually designed in a way that could accommodate shifts in the market and could have been a housing development or could have been a um, industrial or an office development and all the way through the time that, that master plan was moving those two things were shifting so I think we're also conscious <clears throat> in a lot of the work that we do how can we accommodate in the short term um, the medium term and the long term industry on the site so exactly looking at sites like Park Royal and some of those Victoria Road sites some of those sites were going to be held by the train company for 30 35 years as just sites for storing rubble basically and understanding how those kind of time scales can enable existing um, people to remain on site. Um, so that's what we've been trying to look at. And in terms of initial master plan concepts, understanding how this very uh, restricted site might be adopt, might adopt different types of um, typical urban patterns. So looking at what would a courtyard block here mean? Well, we felt that when we investigated it in terms of the existing businesses, that didn't provide the kind of spans and kind of scalar spaces that were needed. What about a boundary block where you shared access? Again, sharing access between um, maybe a mum coming home with a pushchair or an elderly, elderly person who's not very, um, doesn't have very good mobility. That might not be an ideal shared surface with a articulated lorry. So maybe there's an issue about access and how you start to approach access. Um, ideas around a super block, which is the approach that we're currently looking at. Um, so maybe the clearest one of those in London might be the Barbican Estate. Think about how that works and how you have um, very large scale um, pieces of infrastructure embedded in that piece of architecture that works as a super block. And a finer urban grain, I think there's great examples in London where um, employment space exists very comfortably in a finer urban grain. Maybe that's somewhere like Hackney Wick and we've also been working for um, the Olympic Legacy um, group looking at working on Hackney Wick and protecting workspace there. So this is decanting and phasing. Decanting is one of those awful words which gets used in uh, housing um, estate regeneration as well. But it's understanding the existing communities and trying to disrupt them as little as possible. I think that's the key thing. And as, um, as we were saying earlier, understanding how you can shift people as small as distance as possible and not interrupt their business's function. And it's really having that same kind of sensib sensibility to a business um, as you might do to somebody in their home and see how that starts to inform your approach. But understanding that phasing is <clears throat> obviously key. And here you start to see what I was talking about before, the difference in the scales of um, grids and structural arrangements. So this talks about an industrial space on the ground floor, and you can see, not really see here, but there's sort of little trucks and things turning circles start to dominate the language of that ground floor space. Um, but then that also needs to be combined with your core of your residential, which comes down to the ground. So understanding how that would then penetrate an office space in the centre and how those, um, that layering starts to work. And then how you might want to express that in an architectural form, if you want that to become very legible um, or more nuanced. So this is sort of the stage that we're at now with um, the initial designs. Again, looking at a very um, marked intensification of the site, given the developmental pressures, I think it's fair to say. But then looking at how um, large, flexible floor plates at the lower levels can really start to adapt to whether it might be office space, industrial space at different levels, um, and trying to integrate elements such as um, access um, alongside, this is the edge where you have the railway, and trying to understand how we can address the constraints of the site um, through architectural solutions. Okay, so the next project is the Claverings Estate, which is the one that I was describing um, which is in the north of the Lee Valley, so if you imagine, I'm sorry I don't have a major context map, but if you imagine the Olympic site continuing up and up and up beyond all the large reservoirs, this is for Enfield Council. And I think one of the great things about um, industrial estates is they are to, or very often owned by the local authority, or the local authority will own a, f a number of units on an industrial estate, so there is a, a huge amount of policy interest um, in these sites. Working with Enfield, their key um, concerns at the moment are, one, loss of... Um, industrial sites but also a housing um, issue and the amount of their budget which is currently spent on emergency housing for people so looking at how they can um, invest in creating their own housing now to try to um, control that budget better so this is a site and 
The development pressures aren't so strong, so the solution that's been come up with that we're working on here is sort of a horizontal mix. We're also looking at accommodating um, creatives, and I think there is this issue with creatives and artists. This is shifting as well towards production in very many cases, and whether that's roasting coffee beans or breweries in food production, or whether it's um, bike frame makers. Or so I think there are more sort of more overlaps now between industry and creatives, and this is one of the sites um, that might be interesting in that sense. I think maybe my slides are a bit in the wrong order. Um, yeah, so if you see here in the existing uses, the idea of a zoning plan that says this is, this is industrial and it's a, um, in a sill area is actually a nonsense when you actually get onto the ground and you start seeing who is in this building. So yeah, there are industrial units, there's mechanics and typical um, car maintenance, but there's also after school clubs um, on the site. So education, like I said, there's already artists um, who've moved in and potentially living in some of the units um, due to the pressure. There isn't residential at the moment, but that's part of the proposal. And I think there's also things um, like there's social infrastructure, there's sort of a drug, uh, drug drop-in um, clinic there. So there's all of these different things. I think you'll all see there's lots of evangelical churches in these areas. So you see, these aren't um, isolated industrial areas. They are far more nuanced and complex, and that has been adapting over time. Um, so in this um, project, the approach is to separate the um, residential and the industrial access, so it's the industrial spine in the centre and the residential runs along the street frontage edge. So, um, and then creating a cluster around the workspaces, so understand if this is going to be more um, a mix with creative industries and office space as well, then trying to create a communal at atmosphere and a communal space for people externally, understanding that landscape is going to be key to making these spaces legible and enjoyable to work and to live. And then opportunities for height, um, <clears throat> so typically these large sheds are spread over a large area, and this is about intensification, and then providing residential uh, space at, at height. And then looking at live work studios between those blocks and seeing how that can um, activate the site 24 hours a day, because typically these sites are only active um, early um, or during the day. So this is a simple approach then. Um, existing industrial then almost bookend by two different types. This is the sort of live work creative or office space and this idea of a residential uh, space facing onto the street. Is that my 10 minutes? So I won't go into any detail but this was just trying to explain how then you can see the different grids of the project um, being um, stacked horizontally and makes for a much simpler architectural solution uh, in many ways than the the vertical stacking and this is just sort of simple massing explorations and uh, ideas of what those spaces might become. Thank you. So over to uh, Pamela and uh, Joe. So both are uh, developer students at the CAS and um, their study has been focused on current and future potential of industry in the city. Joe is about to start with work with uh, Mark, I think it's already on the way, establishing vital OKR, and you tell me what it is. Oh no, we said we do that in the question answers, in the not questions, in the talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, which is um, the bit no pen wrote. Over to you. Okay, great, thanks for coming everybody. So uh, I'm Joe and this is Pam, um, as mentioned, we're former students of the Cass Cities Unit. Um, this evening we're going to be presenting work that we developed together last year. Our project comprised of location-based research and a framework for future urban design, which uh, was applied to a case study on the historic Old Kent Road. The aim was to influence the future design methodology of the Old Kent Road opportunity area, which we believe could be influential for development across the whole of London. We call this architecture of economic affairs. So sorry if some of the things that we're going to say you've heard already over the past couple of days, but. We based a lot of our work on a um, 1945 book which tried to explain to the wider population how the, Lon the first London plan was going to work. So that's what we used as a kind of template. So this might be a bit of a bedtime story for you, <laughs> with the narrative. Um, so our aim is to inject and recapture a lost optimism for experimental and ethically driven city making, which was one once prevalent in mid-century Britain. 
Um, so in short, uh, we know that London's employment land is under threat, so we're, we're dealing with a housing crisis as well as a workspace crisis. Um, as inner London expands and land value increases, the independent small businesses and lesser known industrial spaces that provide the backbone of London's service economy are being squeezed out. So, so London has a rich industrial heritage. Our city was built on the spirit of the entrepreneur. Historically, London's vast swathes of working land has clung to the city's infrastructural arteries, often filling the voids of land once considered unsuitable for housing. But as London's population continues to grow, Industrial land, supply, industrial land supply has floundered. The managed release of industrial land has been wholly mismanaged. And the origins of decline can be traced in the segmentation and zoning of our city. Um, in a collective effort to make sense and improve upon the way we live and use our built environment, we have um, sacrificed variety, the one thing that a city, makes a city special. So this is an image from the 1945 London Plan showing a rich city of uh, mixed uses as existing and then the intention to move towards um, the zone planning that we're more familiar with. So London's current economic mo model relies disproportionately on the cre creation of unaffordable and lucrative residential development. We believe that London is at risk of becoming a 670 square mile homogenous housing estate to the detriment of the fine grained local economies that must be nurtured. So um, London's economy does not uh, solely depend on the world-renowned financial districts and international offices. London also depends on its sole traders, high streets, messy making spaces, and factories in equal measure. As the city intensifies, it's pertinent that affordable employment land grows with it. Recently, much effort has been put in by ourselves and other concerned parties to understand where and how London's businesses operate. So our project builds upon this research. So recently the Old Kent Road has been highlighted as an opportunity area, including plans for a new tube station. With this infrastructure, the council is proposing the, de the development of 20,000 new homes along the Old Kent Road. Um, Lowden City Industrial and Employment Land has been informally earmarked by the council for redevelopment to residential. It's highlighted mainly in blue there. And um, it seemed to, be less uh, seemed to be a less contentious op option for the council that leaves local businesses vulnerable. And it doesn't have to be this way. So. Building from previous survey information obtained by the GLA, we carefully audited the businesses within the AAP zone. We recorded their very various attributes from location, use, building type, and size. Uh, do you want to take over that? Yeah. <laughs> So although um, not perhaps obvious at first glance, the study area highlights high streets, railway arches, industrial parks, and, hinterland, and hinterlands. And um, it's estimated to currently support over 10,000 jobs. So these images give you some insight to the many types of varied businesses of industry that are around the old, or the old road, uh, road accommodates. And um, so some key sort of characteristics that we found was that they often um, cluster around transport infrastructure, roads, waterways, and railways, and, they, and um, that they often absorb um, and optimize awkward leftover pieces of land, like railway arches. And then often multiple businesses operate under one roof, reducing rental costs and sharing business overheads. So one facade may conceal a plethora of economic activity. Crucial to businesses' survival is the availability of affordable land and flexible buildings or workspace. Often new commercial units in mixed-use developments are unsuitable, automatically limiting the type of business that they can accommodate. Some mixed-use buildings have management plans that apply constraints and limitations on businesses, often down to the smallest detail, for example, their choice of sign and font. Probably the most pertinent constraint is, the, is that business owners often do not live in the same borough as they work. Therefore, they are not consulted, nor do they have a vote, leaving them with no say on the future development of their business area. Um, so for our project, we imagined a more democratic future of the Old Kent Road, an opportunity to, to challenge um, the model we are using for London-wide regen regeneration. So inspired by a similar campaign in the 1980s, we imagined that once again, so the council was energized to bring business back to the borough, realizing that the single-use residential land is unsustainable long-term. So we titled this campaign, Suffolk Supports. Um, in essence, the intention is to encourage, encourage um, a future supermix. So we developed a framework um, of urban principles to guide future development. So our framework 
consists of ethical principles or policies at the core, supplemented by 10 principles and five good practice principles. So, sorry. Uh, so, engagement. So, the city's for everybody, therefore, all should be consulted, including businesses. So, um, before redevelopment occurs, it's important to understand what you have and what makes your area special through detailed auditing and accurate recordings of what is there. And local authorities should anticipate and build for future demand of all uses. So we then looked at uh, the opportunity area as a whole and started to roughly organize the area into localities based on their characteristics, adjacencies, and proximity, proximity to key infrastructure, and then suggested principles that can work in each locality to create a greater mi mix of uses and intensity, or sorry, in de density. So we categorized the roads by their context and vehicle traffic capacity. And then these are some of our principles. So we suggested um, linking fractured high streets as their successful incubators for densifying the local economy and increasing densities um, of all uses along the primary roads. And then different ways of grouping uses within a city block, putting smaller businesses that depend on footfall at the front. And then combining uh, service yards where possible uh, to share so that the amount of land required by each business may be reduced and better utilized. And also considering ways in which the yard spaces can be more social and encourage engagement. And this is the print works in shortage. And um, where they can share, uh, share skills but also resources. And then down to the building scale, promoting flexible structures which can be expanded and subdivided with adequate uh, floor to ceiling heights. And then thinking about the neighborhood as a whole, um, less intrusive commercial uses could sit next to uh, quieter areas, such as this sort of buffer block in the back. Um, and then acoustic buffering within a building. Uh, offices or showrooms could be a positive intermediary between non-residential and residential, um, as well as the street. And finally, uh, to build with longevity in mind with considered architecture and materials. We then rigorously tested the principles on a central site within the opportunity area, which had already been subject of speculative development. <coughs> so the study site, the study site <laughs> largely comprised of big box retail units, fragmented, fragmented industrial warehouses and sheds, and a, an abundance of car parking and hard landscape. Using the existing land ownership, its connections and its divisions as a starting point, we devised a 20-year regeneration strategy. These are the key landowners on the site. We knew that some of them were interested in redeveloping their land, therefore we worked through a scenario to densify this underused wedge using our principles. So the first intervention shows the site roughly as it is existing. Uh, a key ethical move was the implementation of a strong decanting stra strategy where the local authority initiated development by consolidating its existing land assets and building a purpose-built decanting facility. This could provide short-term accommodation for displaced businesses, minimising disruption and avoiding unnecessary displacement. So intervention B, uh, the land previously acquired by large-scale developers provided the next move, with a desire to generate a profit through phased residential development, we envisaged a development that adhered to our framework and provided non-negotiable quantities of flexible and affordable working space throughout. In intervention C, at the first phases of construction uh, close to completion, the addition of key infrastructure is required, reconnecting broken routes, restoring the historic street patterns, and generating plots within plots for future buildings. The large-scale development now well underway spurs the significant landowners to start slow development of this site on a plot-by-plot -plot basis. So big box retail, although unsuccessful as an architectural typology, is greatly valued by the local community. In the essence of not expelling any businesses, we encourage these multinational businesses to diversify their property portfolio and rebuild their stores to accommodate varied sizes of work, working space around the building's perimeter and housing provision above, transforming an awkwardly placed retail park into a new town centre. Through extensive redevelopment, we determined the final intervention to be the most important asset a new civic hub, right with activity and partly funded by the levies and taxation of private development. The multitude of facilities includes a new underground station linking the OKR to the rest of London, allowing businesses, new and old, to prosper through much improved connectivity. 
With the completion of the Civic Hub, the original decanting building is released to accommodate a next generation of startups. So with the 20-year phase development complete, the Old Kent Road becomes a place of economic longevity, with the ability to support a rich mix of working spaces, encouraging diversity by providing robust, varied and affordable spaces, capable of adapting to the needs of the local and city-wide economy. So in conjunction with the site-specific case study, we reimagined how the existing urban fabric of the Old Kent Road in, within the wider opportunity area could adapt and further accommodate new and existing business. So these are just a few kind of quick visuals that we put together to try and show how you can retrofit and not just destroy and rebuild. So these are all existing buildings that have got little tweaks. And that's our final kind of poster trying to get people on board. Um, so our work continues. <laughs> um, we are working alongside our tutor and um, local business owner Mark Brearley um, to create a business group called Vital Old Kent Road to, with the intention of giving the economy a voice. And um, yeah, and, to, and the aim was to ensure that Southwark Council uh, fully consults and consider bus considers businesses. Uh, throughout the ongoing, ongoing redevelopment. Um, so lastly, I guess we would say the Old Kent Road um, is one of the last places in London of real opportunity where startup businesses and a multinational company can sit side by side. Uh, where, artists, um, where an artist studio and a scrap metal yard can afford to share an outdoor space, um, where diverse and interesting communities can come together and flourish. So, as you know now, mm -hmm. areas are very vital. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Time for questions. How shall we do it? Uh, shall we do it like an impromptu um, spatial exercise about, um, about getting 10 speakers, not to the front, because then the rest of the room is going to be too empty. So maybe, maybe if, if, if the three of you move to, um, and you move to the front. Okay. <coughs> oh. Just for these ten minutes. I, actually, there, there's a. Um, our speakers have very generously um, given their time. Should, should, yeah, probably a good idea. Um, which shows their commitment to the topic of industrial space, which is commendable. And so there's a new, there's a brochure here that's just come off fresh to press, fresh to press about Old Kent Road photographs and the variety, variety on offer. And do you want to, I don't know, do you want to come to the front as well? There's, there's enough chairs, but you could share a table or something to sit on. And then I can hand you some of these as well. <laughs> do you want to sit there? Just because you have to leave, so sorry, but you know, it's a sort of celebration. Your commitment to industrial spaces of London does does deserve celebration. So, Christian, when I when I first uh, when you first took me on on a tour, uh, I made this little sketch of it. There was you just told the anecdote of uh, visiting this the sales. Um, suit of the yes. new development and um, being asked, so where do sure. you live? And you said, well, I live, just live next door. And the, and the person said, well, there's no, there's nothing. There's nothing on the other side. No? So there's a question, is there a question about perception of industrial spaces as something, you know, as something amazing about entering no? and, and the richness of it and the culture of the workspace and all that? Is there a perception problem? Is, is part of the industrial <laughs> space problem do you already have one, or do you, do you just need no. Do you have one? Just no. no. Is there? Is that part of the challenge? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, the, the story Mark's alluding to is, uh, I'd like to start to us from gas holder number eight, which is sort of the northern tip of the Argent side. And we visited the marketing suite of uh, the residential area for King's Cross and had this conversation. And I described that we were just based just the other side of this gas holder. They said there's nothing there. Like the rest of the world doesn't exist. You just fall off the edge when you get to that point. Like in, I don't know, Jurassic Park or something. And it's amazing when you enter. Now that tour is going to be amazing. There's wine being grown on the on the oh, industrial estate. Yeah. And it works both ways, isn't it? It's not just that the residents hadn't entered the industrial estate before, it's also the other way around, that you described how your neighbor had never visited the local pub because he thought that was a bit suspicious <laughs> okay. as well. So, so it has a reciprocal suspicion of so, different uses. So the re result of the uh, us being active and getting involved in the neighborhood forum and everything is the, the community has bonded and got to know each other much better. So we literally have a, a, a road dividing industrial and residential. And both, both sides are perfectly nice, just nobody dared cross the line. <laughs> Which you'd imagine, uh, okay, the residential community can look at these factories and go, oh, that's dirty and smelly or scary and I'm not going there. But it actually worked the other way as well. The um, business residents thought the uh, residential area was dirty and smelly and I'm not going there. <laughs> I think uh, you've made some initiative. you've had some initiatives as part of the neighborhood forum to, uh, to sort of bridge that gap. Because uh, I think I was at the Wassail and, and oh, yes. all of those. Yes. Can you speak a little more about those and how they uh, impacted that relationship? Uh, it, it's just part of a side effect of, of developing these ideas and developing a neighborhood forum where you have to engage with the community and uh, uh, ask them to um, fill in questionnaires and all sorts of stuff. The neighborhood in general is just talking to each other much more. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really bringing people slightly out of their shells. Um, I would say driven by adversity more than anything, but, or a, a combined threat. Um, but it's just, just little things. So we, we, we host uh, community parties, for example, just for the hell of it. And uh, people are far more neighborly than you expect. And it's particularly unusual just because it is London, which is generally quite a, th a th anti-social place, people are just running to work and minding their own business. But it, this feels like a little village. Any questions for Abigail, who will have to leave shortly? I, I know I, I have one. I articulated lorries and wheelchairs, how do they <laughs> architecturally? How do you, how do you? No, but I think that's why landscape <coughs> is so important and why organizing uh, pavements and streets. I think when you see these architectural lorries reversing, it's because they know they can do it anywhere, because there isn't a threat to anybody else. And, and, but I think and, if it's orchestrated and organised, then it occurs in the correct place and people can see where that should occur and where it shouldn't occur. And the so. pushchairs aren't really such a problem. Yeah. <laughs> but I th so I think what's, what has been overlooked is that landscaping effect and what happens on the thresholds and sort of passing through these thresholds of... Um, of spaces and how that can be articulated with finishes, with trees, with planting, with understanding how to differentiate so people can share constructively. And that doesn't want to be too, that's not so that the highways engineers take over, which often happens when you're trying to do um, master planning projects, but it's just to have it in mind as a really useful tool in the design portfolio. I'm just going to ask on the end of the I guess you'd have to remove it from still designation if you want to introduce housing. Yeah, so I think that's the advantage of working with the local authority yeah. on their projects with them as sort of the law writers and the um, developers in, in that sort of sense. So I'm yeah, that's how you ensure how do you ensure in the long term that the industrial use stays once it's lost that sort of protection. Yeah, I think that is something that's problematic with the historic zoning strategy that it's only it's so one dimensional mm -hmm. or two dimensional. And it isn't three dimensional or mixed. So, yeah, I think that's something that has to, the AAPs have to become much more um, nuanced and intelligent documents. And maybe they do have to become some people who make that comment for as well, much more site specific um, as well, because generally it's kind of a, a blobby diagram of an area, colour coded, and that isn't, that isn't appropriate for this, what everybody's been talking about today. It just doesn't work. So, yeah, I think there is a big, a large issue with. Um, 
the zoning and the reality on the ground like i said isn't the zoning pattern that you yeah, see sure. in the legislation it's much more interesting and complex than that but i think it, one of those things sort of add to um what we were saying as well is how important process is and whether it's a process in something like the scale of um royal oak over a sort of 40 50 year period probably or i'm for projects probably similar to that or if it's sort of just a process of setting up uh, the neighbourhood forum to start to write policy, I think those that becomes very, very key to all of these projects because we're not going to be able to understand the complexities and divergent approaches. And I think that with housing, there's so much legislation and guidance and we all know what sort of the minimum London house should be. And, um, but with industrial and workspace, that doesn't exist. I think that's something that we all as a profession need to start to build up and work on and it's really great to see so many student projects engaging with that, that's really promising I think. But that is definitely lacking in terms of policy as well, to understand. <coughs> Local authorities take very different views seemingly, no? so Camden are, are, are not as supportive as they could be in your case I guess, I think Southwark and Oak Kent Road seem to be quite supportive and, and, and then how's Barking? Yeah. You've, you've done a speculative... Um, they didn't see... Well, we didn't engage with them at all, but based on the money documents themselves, they were very flexible. Um, Time to engage yeah. with them. Yeah, but to be fair, uh, after we finished our presentations, uh, after yeah, we finished our project, uh, they were really interested in our work, and we presented it to them. I'm not sure how far it's gone, though. It's so. also the issue of the structure of the local authorities as well, because they're all in their own individual silos. If it's a housing yeah. group or it's the regen group, don't talk to the... So that's also one of the issues, I mm -hmm. think. And lots of... Well, I think the GLA have got a very strong role that they need to play to try to push all of the boroughs to share their learning and their understanding around mm -hmm. this as well. And yeah, it needs to come from the GLA at the top, ideally, to help people and to share lessons that have been learned as well. Yeah. Cool, any more questions? <coughs> One of them. It's just for, for the students. Um, so how did you find working with uh, local authorities? Like, did, did you find them to be you know, suspicious about it, working with the area? Because I think there are some cases of uh, students trying to uh, really engage with the area, but it's just because, of course, they expect the project to be uh, a, long, a certain amount of time. So one, one year ago, we just before the feedback vote, trusting uh, students' projects. So I was wondering about if you could find that point. If it was a problem to having these students, like, just... We didn't work with, like, for Barking. We didn't actually work with the local authority, but the business owners that we interviewed seemed to think that the local authority was not engaged enough or perhaps did not have their best interests. So I think maybe the issue is more or less how we engage with them, rather how do they engage with the people that might lose the space they're working on. Yeah. What was that response to you presenting? They didn't ask us any questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that was it. That was sort of that was the whole presentation. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the businesses themselves were, were, us were, the ones that we visited at least, were really keen to talk to us uh, and uh, it was really helpful in finding out how the place actually worked uh, instead of just doing uh, a high level survey of the area. We definitely had a desire to work with uh, the local council, but mm -hmm. they just had to work with the opportunities. Yeah. That's a great thing about uh, the competition. Uh, Peabody are another local authority. They're guided by a social ethos, and they're really interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, as you said, I think it was totally right with that, and I know King's was wasn't quite about people are really defeated about students just because they're central so much in the factory. So, mm -hmm. like, people are just coming over, like, students are just coming over and over to ask the same questions. And of course, like when you say, sometimes students don't really create communities, actually, kind of true, because uh, I mean, it can be problematic. Yeah. Local it's 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 also just simply the transience of students, uh, the reasons to engage mm -hmm. with anything if you're not going to be there more than a year. Um, it's, yeah. it's just the uh, nature of the beast. But if if you if you made the demographic graphic all students, it would be a strange thing. Mm -hmm. It's already. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I mean, in, yeah, in Barking, they don't have, they didn't have any universities nearby, which could be part of the reason why they didn't hate us when we visited but them. I think the important <coughs> point is the reason why there are student towns isn't because students need apartments, it's because it's, it's a very financially rewarding way of doing a development, and that's why there are so many new student towns. What's the one more? Gemma? Um, I can't remember the names of the institutions. Oh, I need to bring them up here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was talking about local authority led to decanting and that they could consolidate their land as a part of that process. Could you talk through that in a bit more detail, please? Yeah, <coughs> yeah uh, on the site there was already some local authority land in this specific little section that we were looking at. and some of it was underused, I guess, um, and we felt that in order to initiate some initiate development as the kind of token gesture, I guess, that we get things going, we thought it would be, it's, it's, it goes back to the framework, the idea of um, something ethical. We thought it would be a good ethical gesture on behalf of the council to have a building that could be used on a kind of temporary measure that would allow one of these displaced businesses due, during this period to operate and retain their networks because that's one of the things that's so important to all of the businesses in London and why they're here and what we're going to lose if they all move back is that these have networks of suppliers and networks of customers that depend on their location. Do you need accommodation for those businesses? Yeah. So is, that, is that hard logistically? Yeah. Just thinking out loud. <laughs> um, well, I think there were a few other people that mentioned the decanting strategy, so yeah, I think that's always going to be, uh, it's not going to be easy, but it, I mean, the idea is to do it as close as possible to where they work and, you know, um, yeah, give something and offer different incentives. So uh, our decant model has, has two specific features. The, the first one is that you only move once, i.e. the building is ready before you move, i.e. not an interim decant because it's actually hugely disruptive and hugely expensive. Uh, for my neighbours, it will cost millions to decant because of their um, uh, equipment that goes with their factories. Um, but the most important one is to not put the rent up. So all the developments I'm aware of where people are being rehoused, residential <coughs> or, or employment, uh, as soon as it happens, the rent goes up. and then you're kind of screwed basically and it seems really uh, uh, unnecessary. Do you control that by being a community land trust? Sorry? Do you control that by being a community land trust? Yeah. In a commercial yeah. yeah, so in principle um, we're setting it up so that meaningfully affordable means accommodation or homes will be uh, discounted from average market rent by as much as 60%. That brings us close to London living wage, I believe is the term, but guaranteed not to go up in principle for 200 years. And the industrial space to be more or less what the rent is at now and not go up, other than uh, inflation kind of statistics. And at the moment, everything's hypothetical and uh, uh, in principle, but we have got uh, hard facts and figures that say it's possible. Good. <coughs> no more questions. It's quarter to midnight. <laughs> and it's, um, it was just so interesting. Time was just fine. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Did you get your brochure? Yep. Brochure is there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm less prepared than usual because of my current uh, <laughs> distraction. I, I bet. That's good. Did you get two? <laughs> yes, I, I got one for, for everybody, but uh, uh, they have to each have a book. Yeah, excellent. No, thank you so much. That's great. That's very nice.